And what I'll do just to start off with is explain to you why I'm examining this topic among adolescents with bipolar disorder. The thrust of the talk is going to be on exercise, but I've looked at a specific population. What we heard about earlier from Dr. Lam is the idea of susceptibility. We talked about stress, and we talked about the fact that this session is about modifying that stress. So to start off with what is bipolar disorder, this is a recurrent severe mood disorder that's previously called manic depression. It affects one to 5% of Canadians, and it affects men and women equally. In addition to the symptoms of mania and depression, people with bipolar disorder very commonly suffer from other conditions such as ADHD or anxiety difficulties as well as anxiety. So these are people that experience a lot of stress from a number of sources. And perhaps least recognized of all of the burdens of bipolar disorder is the fact that there's a premature and excessive burden of cardiovascular disease. What about stress and bipolar disorder? This is among the most genetic and familial of our conditions, but it's also exquisitely stress sensitive. So if you have life stresses and you have bipolar disorder, that's a known precipitant of manic or depressive episodes. When you have those manic or depressive episodes, they give rise to events in your life that cause you a great deal of stress. And when you put all this together, what you have is a robust effects on brain modeling, on brain plasticity, and you can see how over time this contributes to potentially pernicious courses of illness. And we try to mitigate this by reducing stress and reducing the number of episodes. So taken together, what you've heard is that this is a population for whom exercise offers arguably even more benefits than for the rest of us sitting in the room, all of whom can benefit from healthy hearts. And I see uh, soon to be Dr. Laura Jewell, who looked at this topic in our own sample of Canadian adolescents with bipolar disorder and found that although they don't differ in terms of sedentary lifestyle or incidental physical activity like ironing or walking or that sort of thing, teenagers with bipolar disorder seem to avoid uh, intense physical activity. And I think that what you'll see in the next few slides is that there's a missed opportunity here. We call it the ebb and flow study. It started off as an acronym, and we've long since forgotten the, the words, but um, these are teenagers ages 13 to 19 years old, and we have 30 with bipolar disorder and 20 who have no major mental disorders and no family history of major mental disorders. About half are female, half are male. And what we do is, regardless of their background of exercise, they get 20 minutes of aerobic cycling on a recumbent bicycle at 70% of their maximum. So what is that? It means that you're going to break a sweat, it means you'll have trouble holding a conversation, but you're not in pain, um, you're not uh, overwhelmed. This is a good workout, not an intense workout. As we would have in a regular, what we call real life clinic, these are teenagers that have a variety of mood states, a variety of medications, a variety of what we call comorbidities or co-occurring psychiatric conditions. And the reason that we looked at this complicated and heterogeneous group is because this is how our patients walk through the door, and therefore this is the group in whom we, we want to understand neurophysiology. So they start the day coming in fasting, and this is in the morning. Everybody comes in between 8 and 10, and they get a standardized automated measure of blood vessel health, the vascular function. They then go to an MRI scanner where they complete an attention task that I'll tell you about in just a moment. When they've done that, we take them up to the sixth floor of our institution, Sunnybrook, and they get on a recumbent bike. They do their 20 minutes, they do a cool down, and they come back to the scanner. And the whole day takes about five and a half to six hours. So the task is called the sustained attention to response task, and this is a combined task that looks at sustained attention, but also the ability to inhibit responses. And what the uh, participants see in the study is a screen from inside the fMRI scanner where different numbers are flashed in rapid sequence. And they have a trigger inside for which they're supposed to press the button every time they see a number, with the exception of three. So all non-three numbers are go, and then for three, you have to inhibit and no go. And as you can tell, the vast majority are non-threes, and so you get lulled into a go, and inhibiting and hitting the brakes is, is a challenge. So what did we find? These are teenagers that have received one bout of aerobic exercise. And what you see here is in terms of positive engagement, this is from a questionnaire called the Exercise-Induced Feelings Inventory, and there is different subscales. One is positive engagement. I feel happy, I feel content. And what you can see is the teenagers without bipolar disorder had what I would say is a clinically meaningful improvement as a function of one bout of exercise with regard to positive engagement that wasn't really observed in the teenagers with bipolar disorder. And I think we can posit different reasons for that, but I'll, I'll just stop to say that they didn't have the same improvement in positive feelings as healthy uh, adolescents did. In contrast, there's another subscale that looks more at energy. Do you feel refreshed? Do you feel energized? And in that respect, adolescents with and without bipolar disorder both had significant improvements in their subjective feeling of how much energy that they had. So those are the feelings. Let's move on to cognition. Along the left side of this figure, what you see is uh, accuracy on this test before and after. So 
among all the times that the participants saw the number three, how many times did they incorrectly press the button? So they failed to inhibit. And what you can see here reflected in blue and red is before and after the exercise. And on the left side is the adolescents with uh, bipolar disorder, and on the right side, those without. And you don't need to be a statistician to see that there was no big difference overall before or after, and no big difference between patients with bipolar disorder and healthy adolescents. But when you get into the detail of what they do after a mistake, I think that's where uh, the analogy of being a student and responding to stress uh, comes alive from these data. So what you see in the, in the y-axis is post-error slowing. So a natural and adaptive response to having made a mistake is just slow down a little bit and focus. And it's adaptive to do to a certain extent, and when you do it adaptively in the right amount, your accuracy improves. But what you can see here, if you compare the blue columns, is the teenagers with bipolar disorder overreacted. So they'd make a mistake, and they had an exaggerated response. They slowed down uh, excessively. And we call it excessively because that degree of slowing wasn't related to their accuracy. We want to see it related to their accuracy. It should be serving their purposes. After exercise, the degree of slowing uh, reduced. And you'd think, okay, well, maybe they're, maybe they're not slowing down. Maybe they're just hammering through mistakes. But actually, the amount of slowing that they had was now significantly related to their accuracy. So somehow, the single bout of aerobic exercise has trimmed the fat and taken away the overreactivity, but maintained the amount of reactivity that makes you focus on the fact that you've made a mistake. So I don't want to overstate the data. Again, these are all you know, first-time study, but it does give us a sense of how exercise might affect our reactions to adversities, including making mistakes. Two slides back, I showed you that there was no significant change in their accuracy on this test, and that's as a whole group. But one of my main interests is in the role of uh, vascular health as it relates to bipolar disorder. So we divided the sample. These are, all, these are the 30 teenagers with bipolar disorder. Based on whether they were above or below a standardized metric for good vascular health. Um, so you see here those with good vascular health and those with poor vascular health. And then we looked at their change in accuracy before and after exercise on this test. And what you can see is that although the whole group was awash, if you divided it on this basis, you see a significant difference. So the group that had good health increased their accuracy by an average of about uh, seven or eight percentage points. But if they had poor vascular health, remember these are teenagers, they had an average of four percentage points reduction. And that difference was statistically significant despite the fact that it's a modest sample size. And so we'll come back to this at the end, but it does suggest the fact that uh, exercise is not necessarily a panacea and that we should be looking at doses and durations as we would with other medications. What about the brain's response? So let's look at activation. So these are looking at magnetic signals of blood flow in the brain um, during this attention task as compared to periods of rest. In the top figure, you see teenagers with bipolar disorder. In the bottom figure, you see those that are healthy. And what you see in orange is regions that were statistically significantly more active before exercise than after. And let's start at the bottom. You can see that the healthy adolescents had no significant difference in any region before or after. So their brains don't seem to be working any less or more hard on this task before versus after exercise. In contrast, there's robust differences for the teenagers with bipolar disorder. So they're working much harder during this task before exercise, at least from a brain perspective, than they are after. And you know from just a couple slides ago that their performance didn't get worse. So it's hard to interpret the clinical meaningfulness of these data, but what I would suggest that they show is that uh, teenagers with bipolar disorder are able to maintain their same performance in a more neurally uh, or from a brain physiology perspective efficient um, fashion. And then the question in terms of real life would be, can they now allocate those other resources to other tasks uh, and be less overwhelmed? And then this will be the, uh, the final data-driven slide. And what you see here is the previous slide was during the whole task, so 30 second blocks or minute blocks, and overall how hard was the brain working. This slide is a freeze frame, so very, very quick snapshot at specific intervals of this test. And the first, the top part shows you how does the brain look immediately after it's made a correct go response. So you saw a non-3 number, you press the button, quick snapshot of the brain. And what should happen is that there's a deactivation because you know you've done right, you're not anticipating something new, you haven't made a mistake, and so there should be a deactivation. The brain should be working less hard. And what you see in the blue is that the deactivation um, or the resting of healthy teenagers is substantially larger than it is for teenagers with bipolar disorder. They're continuing to press the throttle. They're not able to, from a neural perspective, relax. Then there's the flip side. What happens after they make a mistake? And what you see here 
I should mention that in the top region, uh, it's the anterior cingulate cortex. So you were hearing earlier about brain regions that are responsible for interpreting uh, error and making decisions and also modulating uh, our response to our own internal uh, physiology, much as we were all probably doing about 15 minutes ago while being mindful. So it's this region uh, where there wasn't the, uh, the resting or the deactivation. Now moving down to the errors, what you see here is the activation of a region uh, called the nucleus accumbens, accumbens, and on this case on the right side. And it should be activating when you've made a mistake. You should make a mistake and then your brain should recognize that it's done that um, because either you're not receiving a reward or you're, you're frustrated with yourself, however you would choose to understand it. What you can see here again, uh, very robustly, is that healthy teenagers have a big activation of this reward sensitive region after they've made a mistake. Whereas it seems like the teenagers with, with bipolar disorder, at least from a brain perspective, don't recognize that this has happened. So, the good news is, this is all before exercise. And after exercise, teenagers with bipolar disorder do not in any way look significantly different from those without bipolar disorder. Now again, we don't know how long the duration is of these effects. We don't know the clinical significance. What we do know is that we set out to use a single bout of aerobic exercise as a physiologic probe. And these data would suggest to us that it does have noticeable effects from an emotional perspective, from a cognitive perspective, and also from a neurophysiological perspective. So to summarize, uh, even a single bout of aerobic exercise can change brain physiology, can change how responsive you are to error, can change your feelings. Um, what you saw from the vascular division, whether you're of good or poor vascular health, suggests that it may not be the case that exercise is always good for everybody. And if you ask me the clinical implications of that finding, I would say maybe we shouldn't be starting with 20 minutes for people that are deconditioned or don't have good vascular health. Maybe we should be starting with five minutes or 10 minutes or go 50% of their maximum. So I think we really need to be as rigorous and particular with exercise research as we would be if we were giving someone a pill to swallow. Third point is that research on acute exercise gives us a sense of how does exercise improve our health overall. You give people 16 weeks of exercise intervention, they now have new friends, they may wake up earlier and go for coffee. In addition to all the other things, they're more aerobically fit, and it's harder to say what was the exercise and what was the changing life. And this type of research gives us a, just a, a brief glimmer of what is purely related uh, to the exercise. And now to take it uh, to, to its broadest perspective, I think these findings are, relative, are relevant for students um, and for all people in society in the sense that especially people with stress sensitive conditions could appreciate at least temporary benefits from an anxiety perspective, from an attentional perspective. And this, for me as a psychiatrist, how I use these data are to talk to my patients who are maybe discouraged about using exercise for weight loss. And what I can tell them is that, you know, even one bout of this exercise may offer you some benefits and you don't need to commit to doing this five times a week. Like if you look at healthy living guidelines for Canadians, the vast majority of us don't meet them. And so that can be discouraging saying I can never even meet the minimum. What you can say is even if you do it once or twice, whenever you do it, it could potentially offer you benefits. So this gives us a bit of traction in terms of changing behavior. So I wanted to end by acknowledging the fact that this was funded by um, Ontarians, so thank you, Ontario Mental Health Foundation, and some uh, collaborators within the University of Toronto. So you see Brad McIntosh, who's in medical biophysics, a uh, postdoc that works with me, Aaron Metcalf, and Guy Faulkner, who's in kinesiology, and there are other collaborators as well. So really, um, just to make a comment about the, the breadth and richness of opportunity that exists for students, and also for those of us who are investigators, to collaborate within the Faculty of Medicine and even beyond in, uh, in doing this type of cool research. So thank you for your attention.